Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, <laughs> there we go, rolling. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 84. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at the documentarylife.com slash academy. Last week, we here at the Documentary Life took a week off, our first in a year, mind you, and we traveled to Philly to attend Podcast Movement 2018. Podcast Movement is an annual conference, the biggest actually of its kind, and it brings together podcasters, tech people, radio industry members all together under one roof. It's a great opportunity to get inspired and informed, as you know, we'd like to do here at TDL, by other people who are doing what you do, in this case, podcasting. This was our second year attending the event, and it did not let down. For one, the location was absolutely perfect. We stayed right downtown at an Airbnb and spent the whole week just walking around the city, which was super easy to get around. Everywhere we went, the friendly people of Philadelphia greeted us with smiles and conversation. The cuisine was amazing. It's the best Chinatown in the U.S. that we've experienced. Vietnamese, Chinese, Malay, Indonesian, Cambodian, all were well represented. I think we ate pho on four of the six days that we were in Philly. When you've spent the last year of your life living outside of Rochester, New York, one becomes, shall we say, starved for culture and cuisine like that. In any case, Podcast Movement 2018, the keynote speeches, all of the breakout sessions and presentations, the vendor presentations, the closing speech given by one of my all-time radio heroes, Terry Gross, they were all top-notch. But what really made Podcast Movement 2018 for us was that it was held in Philly. I grew up on the East Coast, but basically my entire adult life has been spent living on the West Coast and overseas. So I was experiencing Philly for the first time, even though I'd actually grown up in Western New York State. If I hadn't already made it clear, I was blown away by this city. It had everything that Steph and I hold dear. It had culture. It had healthy foods and lots of it. People were biking and running. There were yoga studios and meditation centers. And there was diversity, diversity, diversity. And people actually talked to one another. They greeted one another. They laughed at one another's jokes. In the middle of the week, we held an evening TDL workshop thanks to Doc Lifer Nick Justice, who invited us to present to members of his monthly filmmakers group, Rough Cuts Philly. Officially, it was kind of a truncated version of our full day workshop, but truthfully, 80%, I'd say 80% of it ended up just being one big open conversation about doc filmmaking and living a doc life. It was pretty great, and we met some talented and inspiring people who were either already doing some doc work or were getting ready to venture into doc filmmaking. We had people like Aurelian who traveled all the way from D.C. to check us out. We had a Ukrainian woman, Vera, who 15 or so years prior had been working in the TV news industry, but due to relocating to the States and raising a family, she got away from her dreams of documentary and was now fully ready and committed to picking that dream back up. 
Wes was one of a number of people in attendance who worked commercially in Philly and had recently started examining a need to be to be doing something more meaningful in his video work. Shannon was another industry person who'd been working on staff of a production company, and she was getting ready to maybe make the jump to freelance gigging, in part inspired by her desire to be creating her own documentaries. These were just a few of the people in attendance who did nothing but basically solidify our newfound love for the city of Philly, as well as, as, well as our desire and passion for continuing to do what we've been doing here on the podcast for over two years and 84 episodes now inspiring and informing and bringing together a global population of doc filmmakers who are out there in the world telling the world's stories. So I have to say that the workshop, coupled with our podcast movement experience, gave us pause to think about some of the things that we've been doing here with the documentary life. I think it's only natural that the time away from the podcast, away from our home, away from our kids, thank you grandma and grandpa, it allowed us the opportunity to review and kind of reassess what we've been doing here on the podcast and how we've been doing it. We periodically will do this. If you've been a longtime listener of the program, you'll remember that we started out as a bi-weekly show, alternating between shows completely hosted by myself and shows that were entirely a shared conversation between myself and a doc industry guest. In July of last year, we went to a weekly show and we combined the two segments into one show. Another aspect of the show, at least early on, was that I often was including a listener's emailed suggestion or question. At times, we were, re- we were referring to it as the Doc Lifer community question of the week. It was a great way to be including you, Doc Lifer, as part of the show. But maybe more importantly, it allowed me to better understand how I might best serve you in your Doc Life or, or a current Doc Film project. I thoroughly enjoyed doing these segments. I think it not only made me feel more connected to you, but it also allowed us to feel all connected as doc filmmakers with one another. And that's always been at the heart of TDL. Thing is, I think that I've gotten away from that a little bit lately. I stopped sharing so many emails on the show. Of course, I never stopped replying to your emails. I just kind of got away from making it a part of the show. And it wasn't really anything that was really ever conscious. It wasn't intentional. I didn't decide to no longer read them on the program for one reason or another. I guess maybe I just got caught up in making sure that I had the proper time for both my segment as well as the shared conversation segment. But I have no problem in maybe admitting that that may have been a mistake. Truthfully, I think that it's been slightly detrimental to the program. I think that occasionally including Doc Lifer emails was part of what made this show special, part of what made us all feel a little more connected to our passion of Doc filmmaking. We've said many times before, and we'll say it many times more, but Doc filmmaking is not an easy endeavor. And making it more complicated, it can oftentimes be a pretty solitary endeavor. So any opportunity to make us feel a little more connected, a little less alone, well, that's a good thing. And it's why we set out to do this show. So, this is basically my long-winded way of saying that I'm sorry for getting away from that little but ultimately very central part of the Documentary Life podcast. And so when we come back from a quick word from our friends over to blackbox.global, I'm going to read an email to you and then we're going to get into the meat of today's program, which is going to be about five ways to be more connected as a doc filmmaker. Thank you again for joining me for today's episode of The Documentary Life. We'll be back in a moment. After I premiered my first documentary film, Journey to Kathmandu, a film that took nearly five years to make, I remember feeling elated and exhausted. Is there any other feeling like the first time you show your completed doc film to an audience? I don't think there is. Not long after, I took a well-deserved short break away from the city, and it was while I was on a hike, when I had reached a mountaintop and was overlooking the Great Columbia River, that I found myself thinking back on the film and the journey that I'd been on. I thought about all the mistakes I'd made, all the wins that I'd had, how it had felt to finally share my film with an audience, and I thought about the life it would have from here on out. And I began to break down all the components of what had gotten me to where I was at that moment, and all the things I wished I'd done differently. 
And this is how I began to form what I am sharing with you today, a free course entitled The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist. In the Essential Checklist, I share with you the fundamental aspects of making a documentary film, and perhaps most importantly, help you to avoid making some of the mistakes that I made during my first feature film. It is my sincere hope that The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist will help make your doc film's journey the truly exhilarating experience that it can and should be. It's yours simply by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses and enrolling for free. So this show is now downloaded in 145 countries, which by the way, in itself is pretty mind blowing. But what's more powerful than that and it's something that you should be thinking about, is that there are most likely doc filmmakers like yourself in 145 countries around the world. And that is really, really cool. Our top five countries in terms of download numbers are the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. And by the way, we've still never heard from anyone from Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is a total bummer. We've no idea how Bosnians have heard the show, or to some degree, what kinds of docs they're making. So please, I implore you, if you are from the country, please write us. We want to hear about you and your films and how you even came by the podcast. So as I just mentioned, we have a pretty large listenership in Aussie. And recently, a doc lifer by the name of Nays wrote to us with a few questions, which I shall do my best to address here on the show. Nays said, Hey guys, greetings from Sydney, Australia. I'm a documentary filmmaker, National Film School student, and a huge fan of your podcast. It has been one of the most valuable things I have ever encountered in my educational journey. Wow, thanks for that, man. There are three questions that have been in the back of my mind for some time that I would like to ask you. One, after you've researched your subject or subjects and it comes time to write the story, in what form do you do it? Is it a script, a short story, an outline of beats, a book? And two, is there such a term as documentary fusion? And number three, what are your thoughts on the Sony A7S II as a documentary filmmaking camera? I look forward to hearing your responses soon. Best, Nays. Hi, Nays. Thank you for the email and the kind words. It's always great to hear from a fellow doc lifer from down under, truly. Firstly, to answer your questions, and the first question, there are a zillion ways in which to compile one's research and footage and then, you know, start to write the story for your doc. Personally, I end up making transcripts of all of my interviews and I start highlighting these sections and pulling quotes into my into my editing timeline. I kind of take it from there. And while I'm doing this, I'm also keeping a word doc of these pulls and the order in which they're placed in the film. You could kind of consider it. um, It's closer to a paper cut, but not not really, because it's it's also just pulls. And number two, the, your second question about documentary fusion, I'm not really sure what you're asking me here. The truth is when I think of fusion, I think of music or food. I don't think there's a term per se, like a, like a film term. But if you're asking me if, if you can mix doc with, say, narrative uh, forms of storytelling, I think people have been mixing these formats and, and, and devices, storytelling devices for a while now. It's really, it's really all up to how you want to tell your stories and how you as a filmmaker want them to be received by your audience. And three, you asked about the Sony a7S II camera. I try not to give too much advice on gear, especially cameras. While I've used many, many cameras in my commercial and doc career, I found that whatever makes the most sense for your story in terms of usability and aesthetic, that's what you should be using. If all else fails, use what you have. And and we're always saying that here in the program, right? That's why mobile filmmaking is becoming so huge. It's a very viable way to make a film nowadays, technologically speaking. But yes, I did dig the A7S II and the A7S III. They're great in low light set situations and settings. It's small. Um, I, I guess probably the only initial downside that I could think of would, would be um, that similar to the whole DSLR thing, you do have to record separate sound. I hope that answers some of your questions, Nay, and thanks again for dropping a line and saying hello. 
If you'd like to write me here at the show, maybe you've got a question or two for me or, or a topic suggestion or a guest you'd like us to have here on the program, you can email me directly at chris at barongfilms.com. That's chris at B-A-R-A-N-G films.com. I do try and write each and every one of you back, although it, it just may take me a few days to, to do so. Also, I should mention, as of the time of the recording of this podcast, we started another way in which you can get a hold of us here at The Documentary Life. You can call us now and you can leave voicemail. Sometimes this might be easier than writing out an email. And all you have to do is dial us at one 828 Four one nine four eight four five. Again, the number is one eight two eight four one nine four eight four five. Again, we're 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 literally just starting this, so I'm not entirely sure how this is all going to shake out. But I will say that we'd love to to perhaps highlight some of you on the show. So feel free to leave us a question, give us some feedback, or you can even share a little bit about your own doc life. I'd love to hear about that, and then perhaps share it with other other doc lifers. We're definitely hopeful to begin sharing some of these. Voices messages on the program. All right. Okay. So, so not only is it important for me to be a bit more connected with you, Doc Lifer, but I'd say that it's maybe even more necessary for you, the individual Doc filmmaker, to feel connected to a Doc filmmaking community. Feeling connected to a group of individuals who all are actively living the same passion, in this case, Doc filmmaking, if nothing else, it allows you to feel a little less crazy to be pursuing this doc filmmaking endeavor, which often costs money and takes an extraordinary amount of time. I've already mentioned our propensity as indie doc filmmakers to be doing this work on our own, that we can often feel a bit uh, alone in our doc filmmaking passions, which is a bit ironic since, since, as I've mentioned, according to our stats, we now know that there are most likely doc filmmakers in at least 145 other countries. So with that being said, let's dive into five ways to be more connected as a doc filmmaker. Number one, meetups. I think that the first great way to get more connected would be to get involved with a local meetup. I already mentioned doc lifer Nick Justice, who helped me put on a TDL workshop in Philly last week. This may not have been made possible if not for the meetup group that he's been instrumental in heading up. They are a Philly meetup group called Rough Cuts Philly, and they meet monthly at a great space donated by the good people of WeWork. From my understanding, while Nick didn't start the group, he has been instrumental in making it what it is today, only one year later, which is a group of roughly 100 or so people who come to exhibit their films, offer feedback, discuss industry practices, and just generally network, etc., etc. Another doc lifer, Julie, also started a meetup over in Charlotte, North Carolina. In fact, we put on a doc filmmaking workshop there last month and got to meet some of her people. Her group was a little less professional slash industry attended, but we did meet some really lovely people who were doing some cool things in another cool town, that of Charlotte. So good on both Julie and Nick for starting these up. And if you're in either area, you should definitely reach out and attend one of their meetings. In fact, I'll post links to their respective groups in the show notes for this episode. Of course, these meetups are happening in towns and cities all over the globe. I'd recommend getting onto meetup.com and searching to see if there's any kind of filmmakers group happening in your area. And if there isn't, why not start one up yourself? Look, it's a great way to start dialoguing with other people about their amazing projects and also to start meeting with people and learning how they're living their own doc lives. So don't be shy about starting one up. It may take a little while to build it up, but once word starts you know, getting around, you might be surprised at the amount of doc filmmakers that are actually out there in your area. Another great way to feel connected to a doc filmmaking community, and this will truly give you some idea that there are doc filmmakers the world over, is to join the TDL Community Facebook group. It's easy to get to. Just search for the Documentary Life Community group within Facebook, and once you're there, post a comment and introduce yourself to the group. Or feel free to just have a look around and see what sorts of things people are talking about or what types of projects people are working on. We started this group a little over a year ago, and it has just taken off. In many ways, it is a true extension of part of our mission statement here at TDL, which is basically to network a group of global doc filmmakers in a way that allows us all to be sharing ideas and being supportive of one another's projects. 
Initially, I was personally more active on the page, trying to sort of coax people to start posting things. But in fairly short order, the community really took on a life of its own. It's been such a blessing to see doc filmmakers from all walks of life sharing their stories and offering suggestions and tips to help their fellow doc lifers. And unlike a lot of other Facebook groups that I've seen, it's a pretty active one. Not a day goes by where people aren't engaging with one another. And more than that, it's 99.9% .9 of the time always very constructive, positive, and, support and supportive. I rarely have to moderate comments or anything like that, for instance. And you know what? I have a theory that it's because we're all doc filmmakers. And by and large, doc filmmakers are some of the most supportive, genuine people you're going to meet. I really do believe this, and I think it's well reflected in the Documentary Life Community Facebook group. So you should join today if you haven't already done so. Again, it's free, and you can basically get started now. Like I said, you can search for it in Facebook, and I'll also post a direct link to, to join up to it within our show notes. Number three, volunteer on someone else's project. Now, I'm not generally a big proponent of this working for free thing. I come from a commercial film background and no one should be working for free there. If anything, I've seen and experienced myself too many production assistants working for tiny wages and working extraordinary hours. In fact, there was one production company in Portland, Oregon, who shall remain nameless, though I'll, I'll gladly inform you if you ask me in person, who for a while was using interns as PAs. In other words, they were getting people to PA for them for no cost. That's just blatantly and grossly wrong. And I'm glad to hear it's been years since they were engaging in such a practice. But we should remember we are talking about documentary film. And often these films are passion projects with little to no budget. So we're helping one, on, one another out all the time, whether it be by offering free or reduced rates for service or free or reduced rates on our production gear. That's just the reality of the doc world much of the time. And if you volunteer to work on someone's doc project, they're more than likely to help you out when the time comes when you should need it. You know, you scratch my hard drive, I'll scratch yours, or something like that. <laughs> and when you volunteer, not only are you putting some good doc karma out there into the universe, but you're probably learning something valuable yourself in seeing how others operate on their projects. And you're practicing your craft, which is obviously invaluable. You're also feeling more connected on a personal level to other doc filmmakers. And that too, as we already well know, can be invaluable. Number four, attend documentary film festivals. Where else can you see so many doc films and often meet with the makers of these films than at film festivals? We talk a lot on the program about the importance of documentary film festivals. In fact, last month, we ran our second annual two-parter on the subject. If you haven't already done so, I'd recommend going back and listening to episodes 80 and 81, where we had festival director Lyndon Stone of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival on, as well as filmmakers Tony Ziera and Don Mickelson on the program. And they all spoke spoke very well on the Doc Film Festival journey from the points of view, again, of both the Doc Filmmaker as well as a director of a film festival. And as a Doc Filmmaker, by attending these festivals, not only can you be seeing the kinds of films that are considered festival worthy, but you can be rubbing shoulders with other filmmakers like yourself. And I'm not even talking about the directors of films at the festival. The truth is, many of the festival goers, it turns out, are also doc filmmakers. And so not only are you able to perhaps meet some industry people, but you're more than likely to be meeting other doc filmmakers from your own town at these events. And I don't know about you, but there's really just something about hearing a director of a film at a festival discuss their experience afterwards through a QA. and a I always feel a particular kinship to the person because they're speaking my language, right? They're sharing experiences that I've also probably had. I literally feel a very strong connection to that filmmaker who's up front and talking to the audience. And that is a feeling that should never be underestimated. It gives value to your endeavor, and it legitimizes so many of the thoughts and experiences that you maybe have been unable to articulate yourself or, or share with another human being who just gets it. And that's powerful stuff. Lastly, number five, participate in a 48-hour film festival. 
If you haven't already heard of this, the 48-Hour Film Festival is an annual event that happens in any given town whereby teams of people get together on a Friday night at a designated meeting point. They pick a film genre from a hat. They're told of a prop and a single line of dialogue that they must use in their film. And then they have precisely 48 hours in which to make the film. It is at once an exercise in great humility and great filmmaking, or hopefully at least a great filmmaking experience. It can be an incredible high for those who pass the trial by fire and get the film finished and handed in on time. It can also be an incredible low for those who fail to make it through the crazy weekend with a film and or their sanity intact. Sure, it's not documentary specific, it's really more narrative in nature, but what it does is it gives you a shot in the filmmaking arm, a quick fix if you will. It's an exercise in filmmaking that literally must be done in the span of 48 hours. You're in and out, you get to have a, a filmmaking experience, and hopefully you get to have a film that you can be at least somewhat proud of. Again, the idea here is to be getting out there and participating in the filmmaking venture with other filmmakers. Regardless if it's doc or not, you're practicing the craft of filmmaking and you're doing it with, hopefully, with some cool people. To learn more about the 48-Hour Film Fest and find out when your nearest city is participating or how you might be able to put one on in your own town, you can go to 48hourfilm.com. And, you, and if you happen to do one in Portland, Oregon, or Baltimore, be sure to say hi to my main man, Rob Hatch, or Robbie Goo, as I fondly refer to him. Tell him Parky said hi. All right, so that's five ways to be more connected as a doc filmmaker. Remember, if you'd like to see this in written form, I'll be posting these up in the show notes for this episode, which can be found by going to our website at thedocumentarylife.com. Also, I should mention, if you have some ideas of your own for staying connected as a doc filmmaker, I would love to hear them, as I'm sure would our audience. You can either write me at email at chris at barongfilms.com, or remember, you can now also call and leave a voicemail at one 828 419-4845. I'd love to even be able to play some of your suggestions or thoughts. So by all means, give that number a go. Again, it's the first that we've tried of this. So I'm super curious to see how this all pans out. Cool. Well, that's it for this week's episode of The Documentary Life. Don't forget to tune in next week when we resume our shared conversation with a doc industry guest. Oh, which reminds me, to finish, just to kind of finish up a thought which I'd started earlier about reassessing some things with the show. From now on, we're going to go back to alternating weeks between shows led entirely by myself with shows led by a doc industry guest. We're of course still weekly, we just won't be splitting the two segments up anymore. Or at least for the time being, i.e. the next time we reassess the program. <laughs> yes. So we will see you next week when we have on Tim Wardle, director of the current documentary hit that has people coming out in droves to the theater. Yes, I did just say documentary and theater in the same sentence. Tim will be on discussing his amazing new doc, Three Identical Strangers. All right, until next time, I remain your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. Have a great week, Doc Lifer. Don't forget, if you're interested in a guide to help you navigate the fundamental aspects of doc filmmaking, the things that every doc filmmaker should know, then get our free doc filmmaking course, The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist, by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.